You've been lied to. Yeah, <laughs> when it comes to financial freedom. If you follow all the steps in the wrong system, your hard work won't pay off. I know it sucks to hear this, but it can't pay off. two major realizations and five steps that create financial freedom, but you're not gonna hear about them from Wall Street. Wall Street doesn't have the power or the tools to provide financial freedom for you. You can create financial freedom, that is if you follow the basics and avoid just a couple missteps. No amount of money in the bank, no amount of luck, no amount of discipline, and definitely no retirement planner can get you to financial freedom. That's right. This isn't about effort or setting money aside or investing early, often, and always. It's not about compounding interest. It's not about the long haul or budgeting your life away. You know, there is actually a way to become financially free and it doesn't require the blood, sweat, and tears for the next 30 years to get there. There's so many money myths. <laughs> You've heard them, it takes money to make money. That's, I hear that all the time. High risk equals high return. Budgeting, budgeting is key. It's the key to wealth. You're in it for the long haul. A penny saved is a penny earned. In reality, all of these methods actually prevent financial freedom rather than create it. That's right, they prevent financial freedom. See, financial freedom doesn't come from an amount of money in a bank account, that's helpful as a peace of mind fund. And budgeting can actually do the exact opposite of becoming free because now it's all about what you can save and what you can cut out, what you can eliminate, and the mind can become obsessive about reducing. When you spend too much focus and effort on delaying or deferring or having that reduction, you're gonna have limited or maybe no freedom. If life becomes about what you can cut out, what's free about that? See, when I was a miser, <laughs> it was the time that I was the least free in my life. I was finding ways to spend less at every corner. I worked more because I thought I could then save more. And it was the worst time in my marriage. You can ask my wife. We fought regularly about our finances, about our budget. I was consistently angry and frustrated over the cost of our utilities and spent most of my free time thinking ways to save, 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 shrink, reduce, eliminate. Doesn't that sound like fun? Doesn't it sound like it was amazing to be married to me, right? Well, let's get to some solutions here. Let me break it down into three simple parts. First off, financial freedom is actually a state when money's not your primary reason or excuse why you do or don't do anything, okay? It's not the main consideration. So financial freedoms when money is not the reason or excuse that you would do or not do something. You don't have financial freedom if money is the only thing you're considering or the primary thing you're considering. And so I'll break that down into three different measures when it comes to money. There's the price, that's what we pay. There's the cost, that's kind of the economic impact. And then there's the value, which is our overall feeling of satisfaction or joy. Most people never get to the consideration of value because when people are not financially free, when they're trapped in a life of budgeting, they're thinking about price and price alone. How can I reduce it? How can I eliminate? How can I not have to deal with that? Can I get this? Can I borrow it even if it takes me five hours to save 10 bucks? Can I drive an extra 30 minutes to save three cents per gallon? These are just things that I've heard within my family over the years because they got so consumed with lowering price. But lowering price doesn't create wealth unless you're a business that's providing a low, as a low cost leader, a low price leader. The reality is if you become obsessed about that, it blinds and limits us to value creation and to the second measure of money, which is cost. So you could have something be low price and high cost, you know, like, there's clothes that my wife talks about that she's bought my kids before and they fall apart after they wear them the first time. Sure, it was a low price, but high cost because we got to turn around and replace them immediately. There's other things I'm sure you could think of in your life that are low price and high cost. You know, maybe you buy this, this old car that's breaking down. You're like, yeah, it was really low price, but just to maintain it, just to put oil in it because it's burning it so quickly and it, you know, it's getting gallons to the mile instead of miles to the gallon. Well, that's going to be really high cost, right? Low price, high cost. There's other things that are high price and low cost. Getting the right financial person in your life, like an accountant that you pay more to, but they save you more money, you end up with more money in your pocket. Hiring the right employee if you're a business owner that might cost a little bit more, but they produce 10 times more. That's high price, low cost. So we have to understand the relationship to price and cost. And then for financial freedom, it comes down to value. What is it you value about money? Why does money you know, exist for you? If it's just to put it on a bank, like I'll tell you a story here pretty quick about Eugene Brown that I just read, which was pretty daunting. I mean, he recently died and he kind of did this, this crazy thing where he didn't really consider value, he only considered price. When people are financially free, they think value first. 
Why do I want this? What does it do for me? Do I have a feeling of satisfaction or joy or does it enhance my life in some way? Second, what's the economic impact or cost if I do get this? And then third, what's the price and is there a better price than what it's being offered for right now? So value, cost, price for financial freedom. Those that are not financially free, price and price alone. Maybe every now and again think about cost. So when you obsess about money, you're just gonna be less free to do what you enjoy. You'll be trapped from creating value or thinking about value for others, which is the key catalyst to having more wealth. It's expanded value, it's reaching more people, it's, it's thinking of ways that we can serve and solve problems. But if we take Eugene Brown, as someone I just read an article on, who nobody really knew, he didn't, didn't know who his heirs were, um, when he died, it was, you know, five, six, seven days before anyone found him, he died alone. And uh, the only person that knew there might be an issue was really the mailman and his financial broker. They found out he was worth $2.7 million as a hermit. The only people that heard from him was his broker who called twice a day before the market opened and when it closed. He was obsessed about that. He owned a home that was really small and well taken care of, but he also owned a 1984 Ford pickup. In his house, he had no pots or pans. He still had a rotary phone. He had a paper calendar and didn't own a bed, just a foam bed roll that was on the floor. So he kept tabs on his investments with a piece of paper and a pencil. He thought of every way that he could eliminate and cut costs. So he had plenty of money and no financial freedom. And it was actually, it took months for them to find out who his heirs were, were and they didn't even know who he was. Because by isolating, by not doing things, by eliminating and sacrificing, he was worth a lot of money, but what good was that money? How did that serve him? To what degree did it provide anything other than maybe stress because he's calling his broker obsessively twice a day? All right, so as we're talking about financial freedom, let me talk about one more misstep. And if you can actually implement this structure, and avoid the misstep, I'm gonna give you the five steps to financial freedom. So the second piece here is a lot of people, they don't automate their savings. They automatically invest, and so it's going into retirement plans, it's going into volatile funds, it's not accessible if there's a downturn or there might be penalties associated with it. So instead of automating your investing, I recommend you automate your savings. So you build liquidity, so you have staying power, so you have a peace of mind fund. So if some major opportunity comes up, you've got cash to do something about it. And you don't have to cut back to do this. You can find money to enhance your savings rather than decrease your lifestyle. Well, the ways you do that is through the four I's. The first I is the IRS, the second one is interest, the third one is investments, and the fourth one is insurance. So IRS, obviously there's people watching this from all over the world, but I just use it because it's nice to be the four I's, right? But yeah, whatever it is for you that is taxed in your life, we find most people overpay their taxes because they don't know how to navigate it, they don't have the right team, and you can go to wealthfactory.com forward slash tax for some cool resources. The second is interest. A lot of people haven't renegotiated their interest rates, which are extraordinarily low right now. They haven't restructured their loans, so they have less outgoing cash flow and they have more flexibility. Or they haven't reallocated assets where they could take an underperforming asset and pay off that loan and immediately improve their cash flow. The third I is investments. Have you protected your downside? Have you found hidden fees or commissions that are non-performing? Everything from like a 12B1 for your expense ratio if you're not beating other index funds, if that's the types of investments you're making. Or if you have money in a retirement plan and you find out there's lower cost providers that give you the same features and benefits, there's people that just haven't looked as a financial detective to find out there's money that's leaving the door. And it might seem like small percentages, but it equals hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over a lifetime. And then the fourth I is insurance. Do you have you know, it sounds funny to say fourth eye, I think third eye, like almost a spiritual thing, but the fourth eye is insurance. You're like, oh yeah, screw the fourth eye. That's not as fun as the third eye. Cause yeah, nobody's excited about insurance, but this is looking for duplicate coverages or improper structure or your deductibles wrong. Do you have inconsequential insurance that you can eliminate because you have enough savings? But these are places to find money. And if you're looking for ways to improve cash flow, I urge you to look at four different types of expenses. The first one is a destructive expense. To help you automate your savings, eliminate your destructive expenses so more money goes to the savings account. The second type of expense is lifestyle. Don't borrow to consume lifestyle expenses. If you don't have the cash to afford something that's a luxury, well, don't buy it. Don't go into debt. The third type of expense is a protective expense. That's everything from insurance and asset protection and corporate structure or just building up liquidity. It's the thing so you don't have to start over when a financial surprise happens that could be devastating. And then the last expense is a productive expense and this is the way that you become an investor. You figure out your productive expenses. Where can you put in a dollar and more than a dollar comes out? Well, I'm gonna test you and I'm gonna tell you this. On this test, 
I will make money if you do this, okay? So just full disclosure, but I wrote a book. I've been putting five years of my life into this book and really 21 years in the financial services field, but five years of writing, it's budgetingsucks.com. You pay a few bucks, you get the download, pay a few more bucks, you get the audiobook, whichever one you prefer, and you can have both, right? It gives you the map and tools to make more money and keep more money without having to cut back. So on these things I first started with, if you want more detail on it, look, I gave you one resource at wealthfactory.com forward slash tax. That's no charge, but if you wanna invest just a few bucks into your life, and yes, it's gonna be money that goes into my pocket, which I invest a decent amount into this channel and putting this out there in the world, and then I show people how to navigate this, you can grab that at budgetingsucks.com. But to get financial freedom, we're gonna go through five steps. Now, there's financial freedom, which is a state of mind. That's why no Wall Street broker can give it to you or retirement planner. It's when money is no longer the primary reason or excuse why you do or not do something, as I said before. Economic independence, on the other hand, is having enough cash flow coming in from your assets to cover your basic expenses. So you want to create economic independence, but financial freedom is a choice. It's when you start living by purpose, where you start focusing on value creation, where you recognize what you have to contribute to the world and you embrace that because you know ideas and relationships are what it really takes to make money, not just it takes money to make money. So if you want to become financially free, if you want to achieve economic independence, the first thing to do is forget accumulation. Create more automation and build assets. Accumulation is setting money aside, waiting for compound interest to kick in, you're in a retirement plan, and you hope 30 years from now it's all gonna work out. Well, let me spoil the surprise. It's not gonna work out. The market's underperformed, there's too many fees, there's plenty of volatility, there's COVID, there's you know recessions from 2000 to 2002, 2008 to 2010, and we're likely to go through one right now with everything that's happening. So it's a, it's a problem. Interest rates are so low that even if retirees do accumulate a lot of money, it doesn't mean that they get to spend a lot of money because it's not earning enough for them. So create automation so that you can start to build up assets. Build plenty of savings, and when the right deal comes, you can actually buy or pounce on that deal rather than just automatically hand money over. You're automatically saving and deliberately investing. Number two, pay off your loans. If you have any loans that are harming your cash flow, free up that cash flow, right? Build up your cash on the side, and when there's enough cash, pay off the loan that improves your cash flow, lowers the number that it required to be economically independent. Number three, Invest in yourself. What I mean by investing in yourself is not just improving a basic skill set. Look at the most critical skill sets for delivering value in the, in the marketplace. Emotional IQ, so you know how to relate to people, so you have empathy, so that you have an awareness and, and self-discovery so that you can evolve. Or another way to invest in yourself is in speaking skills or writing skills or communication skills because this is how we deliver value to one another. Or it could be marketing skills so that you can take what you have to offer the world and learn how to get it to them, right? Or money, just becoming a better investor or being on this channel and subscribing so that you can learn what is it about money that's so confusing and where can you simplify that so you can be a lot more powerful. All right, the fourth step in this is to stop speculating and start creating cash flow. People are speculating by buying cryptocurrency or gold or mutual funds or you know stocks individually or bonds because they don't know what they're doing or they're buying real estate without understanding what's going on. Invest in alignment with your investor DNA. Figure out what you're gonna invest in based upon who you are and then there's some people I know that have done phenomenal with Bitcoin because that's their life, it's what they invest in, it's what they understand. I know people have done phenomenal with real estate, but there's the other stories too from people who merely said, oh, well, this is a great time to get in, but they didn't know what they were getting into. So start focusing on cash flowing from day one. The fifth thing, to create economic independence and financial freedom is to create and build a life you love. Define what's a win for you in this life now and in the future so you can enjoy the process along the way because you'll have more energy for it. You'll bring the very best of who you are to the table. You're not just doing things that you hate and hope for a better life in the future, giving up who you are in a, in a form of sacrifice that destroys and demeans what you're capable of, who you are, and what the world could actually benefit from you. Let's stop going and chasing benefits. Let's stop working for corporations that we don't love or that we don't enjoy and it doesn't make sense. Or let's stop doing things as business owners that don't speak to our soul or what we can really do to deliver the most value. That's my charge because if you can build a life you love, you'll bring more to the world and you won't need to retire because you'll be doing the things that you want. So stop throwing away your money and chasing some broken promise of financial freedom from Wall Street and retirement planners. Take back control of your finances. Follow the five steps and avoid the few missteps because when you automate your savings and you're deliberate, and you're deliberate with your investing, that's absolutely key. So you 
now have the knowledge to transform your thoughts into profits and build the life you live. If you're looking for more on this topic, check out my video on economic independence. You're gonna learn how to get there within 10 years, right? What are the five levers? What are the five things that you can do to create that now versus way later without sacrificing, but instead through value creation? I'll see you there.